<coughs> Miigwech, thank you very much, Noel, for starting off our evening in a good way. As tonight's <coughs> event is the first in the new lecture series, Deliberation and Debate, I'd like to take a brief moment to express gratitude on behalf of the Office of Indigenization. Given the subject matter of tonight's lecture, Decolonizing and Indigenizing the Academy, it's been an honor for the Office of Indigenization to have played a role in organizing tonight's event. Tonight's lecture is one example of the U of R's commitment to indigenization. Next, I'd like to invite the University of Regina's President and Vice Chancellor, Dr. Vianne Timmons, to discuss the importance of this new lecture series. Thank you, Emily. Oh, this feels nice and tall. <laughs> I want to thank Life Speaker Star Blanket. You are critical to the future of this institution and you've contributed so much. You were so involved in our strategic plan that I think is transforming our campus. And so you honor us by bringing prayers tonight. Thank you so much. Welcome everyone to the first deliberation and debate lecture. And a special acknowledgement that Dr. Blair Stonechild and Dr. Marie Baptiste are here. Do you know where uh, Dr. Baptiste was, just where she just came from? She just came from Chicago, where she, her job was to indigenize the Catholic Church. Not a small task. <laughs> Not an easy one. But that's what she was working on. Quay. Wilali Ak. It's greetings in Mi'kmaq which is uh, Marie's nation, the Mi'kmaq nation in Nova Scotia, and also where my great-grandmother's from. So I wanted to acknowledge you in your language. Let me give you some general background on how this lecture series came about. There has been a concern on university campuses uh, that free speech and debate and differences and diversity of opinion was, is being stifled, and that our campuses have not fulfilled their mission at being places where difficult subjects can be discussed in an open, frank, I have the word debate, and Dr. Baptiste said dialogue, she corrected me, in an open dialogue. It is the hallmark of a university to ensure that this place is a place where conversations, all conversations, can happen. And that's why we brought forward this lecture series, so that Faculty on our campus can bring forward issues, areas of discussion that may not often be welcomed and supported on our campus. I want to give you a quote from Jesse Jackson. He said, deliberation and debate is the way you stir the soul of our democracy. Pretty important. That embodies everything universities stand for. And it seemed like a great name for a lecture series. So this is really a pilot project. This is the first initiative, and we've committed some funds. The goal is for faculty and units to take ownership, as I want to acknowledge our indigenous lead, Emily Grafton did, she took the ownership of this lecture series. And I'm thrilled that this is the first topic. It fits so wonderfully in our strategic plan, Piakiski Gawi now, doesn't it? around indigenizing the academy. I'm going to ask the committee members who are on our committee to please stand. Jack, Margot, James, Andrew, and Lisa. I think a couple of you are here. I think Margot and Lisa are here. Can we give them a hand for their work? We hope to have some really interesting topics in the future. And if you if you have one, let Stephen King know. Stephen, maybe you can stand. Are you here? Stephen, because he's the one that is clear, the clearinghouse, really, for all the questions. So just to end it off, I'm excited about the respectful, challenging discussion we're going to have tonight. And it is the tradition of the academy, and it must continue. And I'm thrilled that you, Dr. Baptiste, is launching this lecture series. And I want to say thank you so much. You honor us for being here. Thank you, Dr. Stone, for being here. We lolly, we lolly, the last one. Oh, thank you. Miigwech, thank you, Dr. Timmons. Next, I'd like to invite Dr. Blair Stonechild to start the lecture with a brief opening 
to uh, decolonizing education in this territory, Treaty 4. Dr. Stonechild is a Cree Soto member of the Muscopeding First Nation in Saskatchewan. He is a professor of Indigenous Studies at the First Nations University of Canada, where he was first employed in 1976. He co-authored with Bill Wazer, Loyal Till Death, Indians and the Northwest Rebellion, which won the Saskatchewan Book Award and was a finalist for the 1997 Governor General's Literary Award. He is also the author of The New Buffalo, The Struggle for Aboriginal Post-Secondary Education in Canada, Buffy St. Marie, It's My Way, and The Knowledge Seeker, Embracing Indigenous Spirituality. Please welcome Dr. Blair Stonechild. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for that kind introduction, Emily. And um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Musha Noel, for your prayer. And uh, it's an honor to be able to make some introductory remarks in advance of our main speaker. So where do I begin? Well, <clears throat> our friends in the South have just voted in a rogue president. He's supposed to clean out the swamps, wherever those are. I mean, how much more interesting can things get? Uh, I'd say the world has become a much, much more interesting place. Perhaps it's the uh, second American Revolution. Will we get more refugees? That's what happened after the first one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as a uh, residential school survivor and long-term time professor at the First Nations University of Canada, I've been able to do a lot of thinking and a lot of work on decolonizing culture and especially spirituality. And as was mentioned, I just completed a book which is called The Knowledge Seeker, Embracing Indigenous Spirituality. And sometimes I think maybe it'd just be called Embracing Spirituality. In that book and in my teaching, I often refer to a collision of ideologies which occurred back just over 500 years ago when the first European explorers landed on our shores. I talk about how over millennia indigenous peoples had developed a sacred relationship with the land, a sacred relationship with all the plants and the animals, with each other. And then at the same time European explorers were able to come to the shores and by the simple act of planting a cross were able to lay claim to entire swaths of the continent of, uh, of things that they had never even seen before. So some can argue that this is a bit of a, an act of spiritual arrogance and that it has led to what is in fact an unspiritual relationship to the land and its inhabitants. I would also suggest <clears throat> that the rapid ease with which European cultures displaced indigenous ones and flourished has left all of us with a legacy, a legacy of believing that as long as one has power and money, everything will work out just fine. Does that remind you of a recent election? <laughs> the elders say that knowledge and learning are sacred. And that's why it's important that Moshe Noel set up set a prayer appropriately to set that stage. I like to refer to spirituality as a, fine, a higher form of intelligence. So when you take that a look at traditional life and traditional society. Under indigenous stewardship, there was always an abundance of food resources and an abundance of natural life and relative, little, relative inequality between members of society. I'm not saying it was a perfect utopia, but now after a mere 100 years of colonization, we now see climate change, 
species extinction, and increasing human conflict over resources. I would argue that at, at the root of this is an ideological gap, an ideological gap that revolves around spirituality, that persists today in education, including in education in this institution. It has somewhat to do with whether, how seriously and whether or not the idea that spirit is part of our existence, that it is one of the four realities, so to speak. That's what the elders tell us. That's how traditional peoples looked. They treated that spirit part as the most important. Well, the creators of this, of this, uh, of this uh, presentation were very ingenious. They were very ingenious by putting it right on the day after the American election. Because I think they realized that we would all need an antidote. <laughs> so tonight we have that antidote. We have a speaker who is very nice, very dignified, very well educated, and a committed pioneer in Indigenous education and recipient of the Aboriginal Achievement Award. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I tried to uh, print off a copy of all of her uh, papers and research consultation stuff. I was scared I'd run out of ink, so. <laughs> but uh, I've heard a lot about the work, great work that's been done in terms of introducing Indigenous culture into classrooms, in terms of helping to create a really viable and uh, sustainable education system, especially in Nova Scotia. So it's uh, wonderful work. Uh, Dr. Mia Batiste is the director of the Aboriginal Education Research Center at the University of Saskatchewan. She has done extensive research on strengthening Indigenous education and has written books including Decolonizing Education, Nourishing Learning Spirit, and Living Treaties, Narrating Mi'kmaq Relations. And along with her hus husband, Sakish, they're a d dynamic duo. <laughs> so, Hence uh, the appropriateness of the title of our presentation towards cognitive judge justice. Uh, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Batiste. And with that, I'd like to begin with some protocols of place and recognition of the, the land on which we are located to which I am, we are on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories, as well <coughs> as the homeland of the Métis and many, many nations that we have heard earlier. I want to uh, start off uh, by talking a little bit about why we do this treaty or opening of Indigenous territory. Across the land, we have, uh, it, through the Canadian Association of University Teachers, we have posted uh, wherever you go, whatever university you're at, you can now get uh, acknowledgement of place. Um, and we do that for a very special reason. And that is we acknowledge the people who have been um, a part of this land and territory, people who have been the stewards of that land, who through um, practicing their culture and traditions and spirituality have held this land in values of respect and relationship, reverence, reverence and reciprocity. reciprocity. <laughs> um, we also show deep respect for the First Nations of, of these territories, but importantly we make visible 
the silence, the marginalization of indigenous people around the world and in this particular place. And it is a, it's a wonderful time that we are in at this point. Um, and I'm really very happy that uh, over the years that I've been in education, I've been at the University of Saskatchewan for the last 23 years. And in those years, we have moved toward greater understanding of indigenous peoples in the territories. We've received now uh, our mandate for treaty education. And more importantly, I think that now we are in a place of indigenization, and that is in part what I want to talk about tonight. First of all, I'd like to talk about uh, a little bit about where I come from. I'm Mi'kmaq from the east coast of Nova Scotia. Our land base is um, built around five uh, provincial ter uh, provinces, and in those provinces we have seven territories that are so named here. And I live in Unamagi, which is a land which is called the land of the fog. Un is fog in Mi'kmaq, and so Unamagi is the land of the fog. And so this land is where my family, I grew up um, with my, uh, uh, my parents, my mother, my father, and uh, a very small but, uh, family. And I put on the back of, the, of our picture here, uh, taken in the, about the 50s, um, of the residential school. Um, it was in the, uh, before I was born that my parents um, decided to uh, go to Maine for a very brief uh, stay while they were working in farm labor, uh, potato picking, as well as uh, blueberry harvesting, which was a nomadic thing that most of the Mi'kmaq people did at that time, especially without uh, a whole lot of income-based. Uh, they ended up doing a lot of the nomadic kind of works that was going on at the time. And my, my mother had just had a new baby, my sister, and, um, and uh, my father said, well, I'm going to go and uh, well, I'll be living in the camps. And basically, it will be too difficult for us to uh, have schooling and so on. So I'm just going to leave. And my mother said, I know what happens in camps. And uh, you're not going without me. <laughs> and so off she went with her, her newborn baby and her little boy. And on the way to, uh, to uh, Maine, uh, my, um, my aunts convinced her uh, that uh, she should drop her off at the residential school where she said there would be kind people with Catholic education who would provide her the necessary training to get her first communion, who would dress her and feed her and look after her, and that uh, this would be a good thing to do. And so um, three years after uh, my parents left, they went and got my sister, who <coughs> had been badly damaged by the residential school system. Uh, and so that kind of residential school has been part of the life we've lived with a, my, my sister and my family. And uh, it's been uh, something that we've lived with all of our lives as intergenerational survivors. Um, my family continued to work in the States. I grew up um, in the U.S. system. Um, and this is why I've got this wonderful English language uh, that uh, was given to me because of the schooling I went to. My family continued to speak Mi'kmaq throughout their days while they lived in, 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 in our home. And so I do have Mi'kmaq as another language as well. Although, uh, for the most part, most of the kinds of um, relationship, uh, it was in this language. Uh, so Bodledek is where they went back to uh, as they finished when they were living in Maine and then in Boston and then went back in 1973, just about the time that I was um, finishing off my education at Harvard, uh, where I met my husband, Sagej, uh, who was my tutor at the, in, in, in uh, public school law. Um, but anyway, um, what are, I think it's important for all of us to understand the great diversity of indigenous peoples across Canada. That we are a very diverse law from, from the north and south, east and west. And that diversity is recognized in terms of the First Nations, the Métis and the Inuit. 
as well as the over 52 to 73 different languages that are spoken. That range is around in terms of what languages are noted as being a separate dialect or a separate language and when um, some languages are like Cree has five different language um, dialects so that those are noted in that uh, number. We have over 600 um, First Nation reserves where the, the population might be from under 100 to, you know, up to 10,000 uh, as the Blackfoot have. And uh, they are with people stretched through rural and urban areas. So there's a great diversity among our peoples and it's important to understand that particular diversity as we think about what kinds of things might we do and how would we do them. Um, one of the things that is uh, common to all the indigenous people, regardless of where they are, whether they are in Hawaii or in, uh, in New Zealand or in uh, the north and the tundra, or whether they are up in, in Finland, the Sami, and so on, is that we've all had, had this experience with colonization, and with it also marginalization, powerlessness, exploitation, racism, violence, and cultural imperialism. And those are the kinds of things that all of us share has been part of the life we lead and part of the, the kind of uh, um, healing that we are working way, our ways through in terms of understanding and becoming um, stronger um, in, in, in our contemporary uh, lives. But the other kind of thing about indigenous people is they also share um, different kinds of characteristics as well. Those characteristics are in understanding that we are all place-based cultures. Wherever we are, we come from a particular place. Some people live on the tundra and know their land and their indigenous knowledge is built on the very relationship they have in those particular ecologies and in the terms of uh, the relationships with the community um, and with uh, being in a, um, within a worldview that is thought of as being holistic and lifelong and communally activated through indigenous languages and worldviews. That spirituality um, is something that also, uh, whether you are from the plains or whether you are from the east coast or wherever, that the deeply spiritualistic um, notions, although many of us have also had um, a uh, influx of, of uh, colonial um, uh, missionaries that have also added Christian and other religions to our communities. That are also our communities are relational and, and resilient. Um, our important features as we begin to look at what kinds of things uh, might we draw upon in the, as we move forward. So what we also have is we have a growing um, population. Our population of indigenous people are that um, the indigenous population is over 1.4 million, million people with uh, a youth demographic uh, that is six out of the 10 are under the ages of 29. And so almost uh, half of our communities now are very young uh, people. And as a result of that, we find our population changing the very nature of our, our uh, provinces. For example, by the year 2007, 17, Aboriginal people from the years of 20 to 29 make comprise 30% of the total population in Saskatchewan, 24% in Manitoba, 40% in the Yukon, and 58% in the Northwest Territories. So you're beginning to see this growing demographic. And with that demographic, there's some interest in the province and the territories with what is going to happen when they have more and more young people, unemployed, uneducated, who are the larger of the population, and that kind of is beginning to become a critical issue in terms of how um, the provinces and territories are beginning to take up issues around indigenization. For these are the kinds of alarming gaps that we are finding, and these are just a small picture of them. There's a whole lot of very severe kinds of um, issues, and that is one in four children in First Nation communities live in poverty, that the suicide rates uh, among First Nations youth are five to seven times higher than not young uh, non-Aboriginal people in Canada, 
with even higher population um, um, numbers in areas like in the Inuit territories. Um, the First Nation youth is more likely to end up in jail than to have graduated from high school. That's one of the uh, compelling demographics that we have today, and it's very important that we keep in mind what kinds of things are going on in our provinces and territories. It's also important to understand what kinds of community, what kind of life our indigenous communities um, are living with. And when you look at um, the, uh, the, human, uh, the UN Human Development Index, uh, for Canada, we find that Canada is ranked right now between the 6th and the 8th percentile, while First Nations uh, communities fall in the 63rd to 78th percentile. And as someone who has lived on First Nation Reserve myself um, and continue to do so uh, by virtue of I have my own home there, I can testify that these are the kinds of terrible dis disturbing statistics that often young people who are particularly not educated or are young and finding themselves in situations um, that are very alarming to them, it, there is a loss of hope. Uh, my daughter who's got a college, um, she has graduated from the master's degree um, in the College of Medicine uh, at the University of Saskatchewan can't find a job in that particular area, and so she does entrepreneurial work in beadwork and other kinds of sewing and things in order to make a living so that she can live with family on reserve. So what is the issue is really that something is that is that we have been all marinated in an education in through and, and with colon, colonization um, in, in, in Eurocentrism. And I had this wonderful graphic that was done by Diane Ray when I did a presentation in Toronto one year, and she sent me this, and I just loved it and asked her if I might be able to use it. But it really is a characterization of how we are end up marinated in this, and oftentimes we never see what it is that we are marinated in, and, and we get become blind to it. When we think about Eurocentrism, Eurocentrism is understood as when you think about um, the work like James Blount has done, a geographer, a post-colonial geographer, he looks at Eurocentrism as a, a, a center and a periphery. And the center sees itself as being superior, it sees itself as, as the place where progress happens, where civilization exists, and from which it then takes out to the rest of the periphery, the periphery, all of these other, um, all the kinds of um, deep knowledges that exist within the center. So, um, in throughout Eurocentrism, has been characterized by delivering onto Indigenous people a Eurocentric education, Eurocentric humanities, Eurocentric sciences, Eurocentric languages, and so on and with all the methodologies and disciplines that go with it. And so basically what we have found is we have been um, deeply cheated in an education that is very limited to us. Our, our first in entrance to education was by virtue of treaties. And treaties were a way that we entered into a relationship with colonies or with settlers who came into this country. And it is through these treaties that Canada becomes a country. Canada does not become a country without being first in a relationship of these treaties. And as a result, Mi'kmaq allowed them to live in these particular settlements, to have their own self-determining governments, to have their own uh, lifestyle, their own language, and so on. However, over time, um, the uh, chiefs began to realize how important it was that they have some shared relationship with them, and it isn't through those treaties that we have particular provisions for education. In the Ojibwe chief um, stated in the treaty negotiation, he said, our hands are poor, but our heads are rich. And it is riches that we ask so that we may be able to support the families as long as the sun rises and the water runs. The honor of the crown was, is part of what is built around these particular treaties and relationships. The crown entered into these particular treaty negotiations 
and it is Her Majesty thus agreed to maintain schools for the instruction and in, in many treaties, there are different kinds of um, provisions. For example, in this one, as to her government of the Dominion of Canada may seem advisable whenever the Indians of the reserve shall desire it. Sometimes it is when the Indians re, um, settle onto a reserve and, and, and are ready for this instruction or when it is advised. Um, so it creates the constitutional mandate for treaty education, which makes indigenous people, our First Nations people in particular with those treaties, a unique group of people to which uh, Canada continues to hold that relationship and for which many people, like those who are here I'm sure, have not had an understanding of what that treaty education has been and as a result uh, <coughs> often misunderstand why we have different health education benefits than other people have. So it creates the, um, the constitutional honor of the crown, and that's the honor of the crown as part of that relationship, and the crown continues to hold that, and we often see that in the Supreme Court cases that come down, um, which is talking about the honor of the crown, and her honor is to continue to carry out those uh, fiduciary obligations and legal remedies for the crown action that overrides choice, which means that uh, <clears throat> that whatever we wherever we have education it is our our choice to choose to go to that education system it is not one that is a forced um, mandatory compulsory education mode and similarly that what we have also in the treaties is aboriginal rights and those aboriginal rights is that where those parents held on to a family obligation to transmit their language, their culture, their community uh, values and beliefs and so on, those are embedded within a um, responsibility that comes from within the family. The unfortunate part of that is that there's been a, the big betrayal, and that betrayal is that you know over 150,000 Aboriginal students were forced to um, attend the Indian residential schools from 1870 to 1999. And if you look at this graphic, you'll see that those little dots are the over 100 schools that were um, throughout Canada to which. Um, in First Nation children were sent to many uh, hundreds and hun you know many many hundreds of miles away from their communities and families to which they suffered. And if you um, understand Gore Dowie's, Downey's uh, video uh, that he recently uh, launched, you'll see the story of um, a young boy who uh, tried to escape from the residential school with with no luck. Um, so we have over um, those number of children who have gone to these schools and what happens with that is that when you have lost your language, when you've lost your skills living in the community, the lost the, the, the kind of living off the land uh, and the connectedness to that land and also to your family and culture and community and so on, the, and Lee losing their spirituality, their indigenous humanity and sciences and knowledge to, has created a, a, a group of people who I would say have been, um, who are living many times um, in throughout their lives uh, a sense of meaninglessness and nihilism that, if, that comes about at different times and, and at different times might take one through depression, other kinds of um, uh, uh, other addictions or other kinds of things that we often take up when, you know, when we find life as meaningless. Um, and that is something that we are continuing to deal with in our communities is this emptiness, this incoherence, um, and, and, and the loss of family values. I was in British Columbia giving this lecture, and I, have, I was with the, half the room was young people. And at the end, when they um, when it came time to, for a question and answer period, the young there was a couple of young people who stood at the microphone, and they said, "What you said back there about meaninglessness, that's what we feel. That's how, what we feel right now." And I was I was really moved and taken by that because. 
in, in British Columbia, they have now moved to develop Aboriginal education throughout all the K-12 system, and they have been making tremendous progress with that. So the TRC noted that the impacts of the Indian residential school were immediate, ongoing, devastating, but they also, the most important thing, or one of the important things, is that most Canadians do not understand what went on during those years. That that has been a whole uh, silence of, of, uh, of a history that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission are trying to make sure that we have an understanding of that. But understanding that helps you to understand what has happened to Indigenous people, what is going on today, and what kinds of needed changes need to be made. There are some blame frames that have been used as a result when we think about the different kinds of things that have, when we look at um, people, indigenous people's uh, problems and so on, many kinds of ways uh, people have utilized uh, ways to think about why did that happen. Oftentimes that is when people think they are pretty good, they're pretty just people. And so when they think about their own justness, they often put the blame thus on the individuals themselves. And in those cases, often, as we look at the first one, is the God frame, that was when the missionaries came. And they said to us, under this, the unjust outcomes come about are justified by the presence or the absence of God's grace. God didn't bring that grace to these people, thus they are suffering for that. They also have also have said they probably possess the devil. And oftentimes they have in, encouraged us to name our very name of our God, the devil. For in my language, Mundu is the, the name that we use for God. And then over time, the missionaries convinced us that Mindu was a devil. So now when we say Mindu Alilie, we're saying, go to the devil. And so um, the other one is the evolutionary but nature biological. And that is that the indigenous people have um, had unjust outcomes that are dictated not only by the divine, by God, who didn't give them all of the, the, the right kinds of uh, knowledge and so on, but they have certain genes or inherited qualities. Maybe they have a head that is smaller than other groups, and maybe they would take, and like the whole eugenics movement, where they would take and fill up the, uh, a skull cavity of, of uh, people to determine whether or not they have the same size head as another group to determine whether or not they, in fact, um, are as smart as. So that is another one. The other one is this market preference personality character base. The character base choice frame is that actually indigenous people have unjust outcomes because they choose this. It isn't because you know, they, you know, they actually don't know how to make good choices. So they make these bad choices and it is in their character to do so. There's other ones, and you probably have heard these in throughout your colonial histories. And the other one is the history, uh, custom, tradition, precedent schema, in which unjust outcomes are reflected by the extent to which individuals or groups comply or deviate from the historical lessons, practices, and values that are leading or led some people in the golden age to progress. So some people go to progress, some are kind of stuck in, in, in tradition and they can't seem to move out of this and, and move on, that societies have an evolutionary scheme and they get to progress and these people did not. The other one is the healthy normal schema and that is that um, unjust outcomes are the result of the extent to which the individuals or uh, the groups have a healthy, um, normal constitution. So some people who are in this group uh, don't have a healthy, are, are, are thought of as um, not healthy enough, they, and so they can't make good choices, they're not able to move on. And finally, the other one is the culture leader schema, the culture frame. And the culture frame is that unjust outcomes 
are reflected by the merits of a group's presumed basic shared disposition. They're a group, they're a cultural group. They all share these same dispositions and basically the reason why they can't seem to progress is because of this, um, this stuck in culture um, notion. And when we look at the, the ways in which the church also colluded with the, with the um, settlers at the time, we note that for over a century, the central goals of Christianity and Canada conspired to eliminate indigenous knowledges, spirituality, and languages by, the, by an educational system. It ignored the Aboriginal treaty rights that were protected uh, by imperial law of Great Britain, Britain, including the freedom of their religion. And through a process of assimilation through the residential school to cause Aboriginal people to cease to exist as a distinct legal, social, cultural, religious, religious and racial entities in Canada. The establishment and operation of the Indian residential schools and the church supported day schools that were also an element of this policy which can be described and has been described uh, in the TRC as cultural genocide. When we look at the kinds of things that you know we are looking at today in terms of uh, how do we d d look at the problem and what is the solution? So oftentimes when we think about what do we do about the problem in, in institutions, the first problem is of culture, is that culturalism is a way in which you diagnose the problem but also use it as a basis for providing the outcome. In other words, culture is a problem but culture is also the answer. So we give them powwows, we give them all kinds of uh, cultural activities and, and elders and so on. And basically what we're saying is that the culture is the problem. That the culture, if we need to fill them back up with culture. We took it away, we're going to fill them back up. So there's, a, there's an issue there. The other part of it is the problem with the student, is that these students who come through don't have literacy, didn't come from a good school, they didn't have the, the right kind of uh, education background that came from um, learning English in, a, in a, an English context, much like the, those in provincial schools and so on. And so it becomes a lot of pathologizing. So pathologizing is about how we say the student is the problem. So we need to give them a whole lot of these kinds of activities and, uh, and other kinds of things to fill them up so that they can move successfully through school. And the other one is one of the problem of what I call a problem of inequity. And that is if you focus on indigenous students as an other charter group, like you would take up um, racialized or my, um, uh, minoritized groups and so on, that basically you take them up as all being equal. All the women are equal to the indigenous people, to the, to the black students, to the uh, refugees, to the immigrants, to all these groups. You treat them all equal. And what happens with that is that you ignore the very fundamentals of the, both the treaties and Aboriginal rights that the foundation of an education that they were guaranteed, for which the country and all of its settlers and their descendants took away from them. And now we are a place where we're bringing back and thinking about what does it mean to have a treaty, an Aboriginal right, in an education system. So, I've coined this word over the years, uh, the cognitive imperialism, which comes from um, a course I took in cultural imperialism with Martin Carnoy back in 1970-something or other. Um, but anyway, what culture, uh, cognitive imperialism is the kind of thing that I talk about as what we lost. We lost it when we went into these um, assimilated schools, losing that language, losing that uh, connectedness to all things, the nihilism that comes from it. So then success in, an assim in, in cognitive imperialism is defined as assimilation to dominant Eurocentric values, norms, and languages. So oftentimes I've been told, oh, you, you're such a success. You speak so well. Or that, you know, you've done so well, you've got all those degrees and all this education. And I say, it has been at a loss. 
What I have had, what I gained, has been at a loss of all the other kinds of things. And now, with all of that education, I can speak to it. I can speak to the losses that many, many people have not yet the language yet to address their own particular losses and their well-being that has been as a result of that. And it has eroded our collective cultures and languages and communities by the use of this English only or English only and French in some cases. But nonetheless, it is the way in which we create multiple oppressions. They are layered as raced and classed and gendered and normalized in discourses and hidden curriculum. And while often I have said many times we have no such thing as races, uh, we have no thing as white race and black race and yellow race and, and, and any other colored race, what we have is racialization by the way we've been negatively treated, and we do have racism in the discrimination that we've suffered. And so we need to understand what does race and racism, what is the relationship to that? So we also recognize that our, our, our indigenous students are continuing to live with a dissonance, and Gregor Kahete once used the word bingahe. And Big Hay, he was to say, and if you read that in my book, uh, um, in uh, uh, Reclaiming Indigenous Voice and Vision, Gregory Hayday's work, he's talking about the way in which indigenous students have both a, a have to have a personality that exists, smiling, working through, and, and being resilient. And the other side of it is dealing with the whole colonial mentality, the background, the, the layers of historical dysfunction that might have been part of their own family or their own home and or and continuing to be so in terms of the poverty and lives that they're living in the day. So those are kinds of things that still continue to evolve. And so we find that cognitive imperialism is something that generates throughout our university education. It is the kind of thing that I started taking Western civilization, English, Western civilization, um, um, Western art, were the first courses I ever took in, in, in my liberal arts education. All of that continuing to be a Eurocentric education. So we have that, that continuing building on and creating the representation of the indigenous person as silent or marginalized or um, is one that is um, stereotyped by all the uh, con um, constructions that have been created in our, in our knowledge economy. So we also are in that privileging of, of certain kinds of colonial languages and discourses knowledge, values, and beliefs, and all of that is socially constructed. In other words, we create the discourse we use in the social uh, networks that we continue to use, and you only need to know that when you go into a class and you absolutely don't know what the professor is talking about. That is a, a, an example of a discourse that was created within a particular discipline to which you are unfamiliar, and which is typically then a Eurocentric discourse. Um, what, I, what I want to say is that cognitive imperialism is something we all have to deal with. That is me, that is all the elders that, who have been um, today. There's not one person that has not been touched by the Eurocentric framework that is part of law, part of government, part of the discourses of, of the books and, and, and um, media. It is TV, it's popular media, social media, it's all of those kinds of things. Um, and that we are, have a very difficult time getting out of it and not seeing it. And so when we think about what kind of education we need to move to, an indigenous education, cognitive justice education, we recognize that first of all, that we have not been given the education that enables us to get there. We are still working that through. And even today, even after all the kinds of um, you know, research and work that I'm doing, I would say that I'm still at a, a very nuanced area in terms of addressing these kinds of things, partly because we are still working through uh, Social Science Humanity Research Council that has been Eurocentric in its nature. Only in the last couple of years do we see any attention given to indigenous indigenous knowledges or uh, to indigenous research and other kinds of methodologies that are unique to indigenous people. And what we are finding is um, a lot of new changing events. 
And one of those catalysts for events uh, have been, of course, the United Nations. And the United Nations, through the, um, through the Working Group on Indigenous Populations from years 1980s on into 90s, um, and which then created the world's permanent forum, there was Erica Diaz, who was the rapporteur for the World Indigenous Forum, and she, or for the World um, Working Group on Indigenous Populations, and she said, displacing systemic discrimination against Indigenous peoples created and legitimized by the cognitive frameworks of imperialism and colonialism remains the single most crucial cultural challenge facing humanity. Meeting this responsibility is not just the problem for the colonized and the oppressed, but rather the defining challenge for all peoples. It is the path to a shared and sustainable future for all peoples. So when we move on to that, we begin to realize that there are many kinds of things happening today. Many things, for example, that Canada is built on Aboriginal treaties and compacts, Constitution of Canada 1982, that reaffirms Aboriginal and treaty rights. And since 1982, that reaffirmation of Aboriginal treaty rights is not often used, except in the courts, to remind the people that they have to, to follow that mandate. But provinces have to do this as well. This is not just you know, the federal government having to do it. It's all. If the Constitution of Canada belongs to all of us, then it is in all of our hands. And so it becomes a historical imperative to reaffirm the Aboriginal treaty rights. It becomes, because of the population and the growing number of people that are Indigenous, we have an economic imperative, and that is the one that the provinces are now beginning to see as a looming problem in the future. Now, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission on the Indian Residential Schools has demanded a reconciliation as of 2015, and it creates thus a moral imperative that that whatever happened needs to change for all of us. And finally, recognizing that education levels are the lowest among Aboriginal peoples, that creates an educational imperative as well. The Constitution Act has been a very important kind of thing that all of us need to understand, but the courts also have been there reinforcing what Aboriginal and treaty rights mean. And um, after the Aboriginal and treaty rights came down, they said, well, what are these Aboriginal rights? What is Aboriginal rights? Well, Aboriginal rights is everything that an Aboriginal person held before they entered into the treaty relationship and, and either gave up some um, land to the depth of a plow or gave uh, settlements or agreements such as our treaties is that we would handle our disagreements in the courts as well as accept presents which we were supposed to receive every year um, and every person in that community was to receive these which did not happen. And in the courts, R.V. Cote, who said that where there is an Aboriginal right, there is a corresponding right to teach that right. And so if we have Aboriginal rights, we have, uh, we have treaty rights, that all families in our communities have a right to teach to their children those rights, but more importantly, that all of the Canadians uh, throughout Canada has also a, we are all treaty people, have a right and thus an obligation to understand their own treaty um, connections. It was at the uh, treaty conference, the First Ministers of Canada wrote uh, that Aboriginal treaty rights play a determining role in improving the quality of life of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Their distinct social, cultural, historical, and legal traditions are a defining feature of Canada and form an important context for cooperative efforts to improve their well-being. And so when we look at the issues around treaty rights today and the kind of treaty education, these are the kinds of things we're doing. One, to make sure everyone understands their treaty um, obligations and their treaty rights, as well as to recognize that this should have contributed to indigenous people's well-being. 
that is their economic well-being, that is their educational well-being, that is their uh, material well-being, as well as their spiritual well-being, however, whatever their context is. So Aboriginal rights do empower Indigenous knowledges. It does acknowledge value and necessity for those uh, traditions and healing practices and spirituality and connections to the land that continue. And that our Constitution rights also require consultation with Indigenous people. In other words, that part of the case in Haida was because that they did not consult with the Indigenous people and assumed that they didn't have to that they could conduct all this business. Well, in that case, it showed that indeed they do have a need to consult with Indigenous people um, and before any kind of changes to their treaties are done. And so it, it activates community uh, voice and agency and also to uh, work on uh, their Indigenous knowledges and languages. One of the important transforming contexts it's called a resurgence in some places. It's called an indigenous renaissance in some other places. It might be seen coupled up with that whole post-colonial movement. But we do have indigenous scholars and activists and uh, researchers um, and leaders uh, who are leading a discourse now on respectful research and decolonization practices that honor self-determination and also indigenous healing. And this growing movement is, is in, the, in the idol no more. It is those people who are standing uh, for the land as water protectors at Standing Rock. It is those who are protecting the waters in my territory uh, near Shubenagany. It is those who are, in, and there's, I would say, probably about 50 places across Canada where Indigenous people are now protecting and standing firm that they are not going to have their lands, uh, their waters abused used and, and used. In fact, if you look at my own community, we cannot even drink anything out of the water in our faucet. It comes out black. I don't know if you've seen anything on the Mi'kmaq community in the last month. It, it comes out of the faucet black. And, and they say, oh no, it's, it's okay to drink. It's just magnesium. It's high magnesium. Well, it isn't just high magnesium. It also creates boils on my sister's body. And can you imagine what it does for babies who have to be washed every day and children who go to school and be washed in those waters as well as doing their laundry? So the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People has several important provisions in it. And I offer only a couple of them here. But this one is that in, in Article 13.1, it says that Indigenous peoples have the right to revitalize, use, develop, and transmit to future generations their languages, their philosophies, their histories, their oral traditions, their writing systems, and their literatures. In another one, in, in, in Article 16, um, it says that indigenous people have the right to the dignity and the diversity of their cultures, traditions, histories, aspirations, which shall be appropriately reflected in education and public <coughs> information. And there's many, many provisions, and I don't want to belabor it, but I would say that look at the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People and all those provisions. Today, Canada, at least Trudeau, and his government has said that they would like to build their the government on these particular provisions, although there has been some discussion about how do you implement, how do you enforce these, and should this be a government uh, role to play in enforcing this? And they have held that that is not something, it's an in, in, it's human right, it's an, in, it's an indigenous right, and basically we need to find other ways to bring about uh, the, these rights to indigenous people without the kind of the, the hard arm um, and hammer and uh, force of, of the federal government. So when we look at indigenization and looking ahead, we have to recognize that indigenization is not for indigenous peoples, students and faculty. It is not for us. And it is not just about us and that in that in this has to be an inclusive understanding because what we have found in the in the TRC is that basically all Canadians have missed out on this particular education and all 
Canadians thus must have this understanding of this education, including Indigenous people who also have not had that that they have been denied that opportunity. And so we need to build an inclusive dialogue around indigenization, as well as to work with indigenous partners from local places. That there is no, there's no silver bullet. There is no, um, no one um, pedagogy, not one particular thing that fits all people. That what happens in these local places need to be worked out with the people in the particular context in which they are coming from, which is why it's important to have Musham uh, Newell and, and uh, our elder um, Blair Stonechild and Ibrahim and others who are here to help guide that particular process. And we also have other kinds of uh, moral imperatives moving around in the world, and that is partly through the Universities Canada. Universities Canada is made up of 190 institutions across Canada. 97 institutions across Canada, and all of them have since signed on to this notion of um, a, an Aboriginal indigenization agenda. Um, although I still have some problems with the way in which it's been put forward, but basically they're moving along in this way. And we need to have that opportunities to learn those histories. As we move to looking at cognitive justice, it's important that we remember that, you know, in our communities, when you added families, when you added communities um, into your home, you extended the rafters. And so what we need to do is think about how do we extend the rafters of our, our, our uh, universities in order to make it stronger to include uh, indigenous space and time and hires and to move those collective agreements to support and accommodate indigenization, indigenous languages and so on, and to identify the issues of inequalities and the barriers that continue to exist and find ways to do that. I'm gonna quickly just pass through these. I got only a few minutes to, to uh, say to you that when we look at um, um, David Bernard's comment um, as chair of the University of Canada, he said, when understanding of First Nations, Métis, and other indigenous cultures is woven throughout all of the campuses, then real change will occur. There is also a notion that we need to think about reconciliation. And reconciliation is a word that includes anyone with an open heart, an open mind, and who's willing to look to the future in a new way. And I hope that's all of you who are here, and thankfully you have come to hear this tonight. Reconciliation has been named in many different kinds of ways. Nelson Mandela talks about it as working to correct the legacy of past injustice. Uh, Murray Sinclair talks about it as a standard of restoring balance in the relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people. And then the Chief Robert uh, Joseph, who was a, in, um, a residential school survivor, notes it is to weave uh, a stronger and more vibrant social fabric based on the unique and diverse strengths of, of Canadians and their communities. And so I also put this forward. It's important that we understand that it comes from a head it comes from our heart, and it comes from our hands. Our head is the awareness of our past. It is the heart that we take and bring home this atonement or to understand colonialism and racism and policies and structures that have created these inequities. And then finally, for each one of us to take our hands and take our hands to social action and social change. Sometimes our hands might be our full bodies. It might be to stand with people at Standing Rock or stand with other people who are fighting for their lands or waters or other kinds of things. And when you do that, as I I've often found that indigenous people are open to that as well as ready to teach as well as help others to feel comfortable in those particular places. And this finally is what I think is a, a place to what I'd like to take us to is this trans-systemic transformation. We should not just have a, a bridge to which we get over and uh, on either side, meaning that we're finding a way across something. But we need to really think about that indigenous knowledge has a way for the future to become its own road. And that we can find these to be parallel structures that can continue to grow in such a way as that we can all 
take that road and, and it becomes a place for us to go. And I would like to just uh, conclude with um, these final words, and that is that when we look at the ways in which education across the country has gone, we find that silence is the shield of domination. And that means that when there is no indigenous people in the curriculum, when we see indigenous people not taken up in a course, when we see indigenous people not within the academy and in, in certain areas like the sciences or in, in particular areas, then we have to see that as a form of domination that is yielding itself. And then the other one is one where a lot of people think, well, I, I you know, I, I have no role to play, it's not for me to take on. And that is that, and I love this one, is that Oslam and D'Angelo write that the most subtle yet powerful way we resist knowing is simply by being uninterested. And finally, if there's anything that I'd like to have you tweet out tonight, is nothing about us without us. That you cannot take on indigenization without indigenous people, without the dialogue, without the students, without the communities, and without the languages and knowledges that they come in and rightfully have. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak to you tonight. Well, miigwech, thank you, uh, Dr. Batiste. Um, thank you for that compelling talk. As many who spoke this evening pointed out, it's very timely and important that we talk about indigenizing the academy. We're gonna open up the floor now to question and answers. Um, so we don't have a microphone to circulate around the audience, so we just ask that you please stand up and speak clearly so that we can capture with our recording. Thank you. Please, no debate. <laughs> no, discussion and dialogue. Well, first of all, thank you for coming and speaking with us today. I think these are really great discussions to be having, and it's really nice to have people who are who are sharing local space with us that are doing work in our shared space, because we also are on Treaty 6 territory, as well as you know. Um, in, in talks of moving forward with indigenization, and in your experience and what you've been doing in your path, because I, I definitely think you are someone we can lead by example from, uh, what are quick things we can do on an active, ongoing basis? I know the hand's there and the, there's that, but I guess as, a, as an institution, <coughs> I would ask that. And um, we have a lot of students, we have a lot of learners. What's like, what's like quick, quick things we can take responsibility of to move this forward in a good way? Okay. Well, thank you very much for that question. I think that there is both a individual, personal kind of um, enactment, uh, but also a collective one. And I think that we belong both to to both you know a personal kind of thing, as well as we belong to a family, a community, and multiple communities in in the places in which we uh, work, as well as in which we go to school. Um, and those need to be also thought about. So when we look at things like what can you do at the individual level, I say that the, one of the most important things we have to do is understand colonization. And understand colonization, recognizing uh, that there are different discourses of colonization. There are those that have been written and talked about uh, by non-Indigenous authors. And I think it's time that we look to Indigenous authors and begin to look there. And finding Indigenous authors who talk about their unique experiences, um, and, and then we get a sense of what is it that is going on in, 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 in different multiple places. And you can find, um, if you're looking at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, one of the most powerful pieces, and very cheap and very small, is a knock at the door. It's, the, it's a very small book um, of the summary of the TRC. Uh, $15 is what that thing costs. And it is probably read in three or four hours, but it is powerful and it gives you the uh, straight out 
what happened. Um, so understanding TRC, understanding what happened, but understanding the discourses of racism, that each one of us is both a, a victim and a beneficiary of the same kind of system in which we've lived, and we never really understand when our discourse is racist, when we have a discourse that we think is normal, is the way we've already talked about it in our community, in our home, and you know, with my husband, whatever, but you never know what that discourse feels like to, a non, to an indigenous person, to a disabled person, to a, a person from a marginalized equity group, um, and so on. So we need to understand that normalized discourses of dominance are what we have always come to know and use. And that because it's been normalized, we don't recognize the effect it has on others. And so people say, oh, they're so sensitive. And they're so, you know, I don't know how to be politically correct. Um, but I think that those are the kinds of things that we need to do. One of the best books that, that I've used is Are We All Really Equal? It's written by Sensoy and D'Angelo, 1992. Um, and it's a New York um, press. But in it, it helps people in good uh, lay language to understand how racism looks and feels like when we are operating within different constructions of knowledge. And it is powerfully good. And so I use that as one of my core texts in the course that I teach on anti-racist education. Um, so that's on an individual level. We need to understand that kind of thing. Uh, we need to understand. But I think that what we also need to do is we can each take a hand and talk with indigenous people. We need to understand what the experience is from indigenous people's experiences, from elders' experiences, from uh, experiences of our, our communities and so on. And people love to share and talk. And so storytelling is one of the lovely ways in which we uh, are able to do that. And I think that if, if you were on an individual level to find some indigenous people who will help guide you in the right protocols to open up to find ways to talk with indigenous people, you'll find that that is a very helpful way to do things. Um, the, on a collective level, I think we, we under, ha, understand that we belong to multiple collectives, and we have to bring the collective along with us. Sometimes we take it on as an individual thing, this is my thing and only my thing, but if you see yourself as belonging to these multiple collectives, we can educate our family, we can educate our communities, and we can educate our friends, and we can stop racism in the tracks when we hear it, when we hear um, different forms of uh, discriminatory language, uh, we can stop it. And so um, there are ways that we can do it also in terms of helping people to understand where they are as a collective. So if you've got a group of people, understanding what do we know here, and taking these small little tests about what do we know here, and then getting a collective understanding of what do we know, and thus what do we need to then build upon. These are just small little things that I think might be able to help with that. Thank you for that question. Saskatoon. She was in Regina for a book launch last Saturday. Mm -hmm. We stopped her. And then uh, we were criticized. <coughs> you should have let her go to the book launch and done something else. What would be a better appropriate <coughs> action? <coughs> okay. Um. Let me see if I got that. 
there was a book launch, Neil Stonechild's book, and someone was going to it, but they were stopped because why? The, the author, um, because it's a racist book. Oh, because it is a racist book. Okay. And Larry Hardwick, one of the constables, was there with Candace McLean. Oh. He actually grabbed one of the, he was uh, using his cell phone, videotaping one of my friend's kids. She asked him politely three times to stop that. And then she actually pushed his cell phone away. He grabbed her arms behind her back and said, you're under arrest. This man was fired from the Saskatoon police. He lives in Calgary. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, and I'm sorry the experience that it took you and your, your, your friends through. That is a, a, a terribly unfortunate. I think that, you know, um, we are continuing to experience both mild forms to very, very extreme forms of racism in all kinds of different encounters and places, whether it's even in the church or whether it's in schools or whether it's in the police, that we're going to find those kinds of things. I think that, you know, for me, um, I would never tell anybody not to do something as to go somewhere, but I, unless it was dangerous and, and you knew that and you need to be forewarned about that. But I think that, especially when you have an opportunity to ask people questions, it's being able to ask an appropriate question that gets someone to think about what it is that they've just heard or done. Um, and um, that's always difficult because sometimes people don't listen well and do not take up uh, a question well and don't know how to respond to it without just, you know, exuding some kind of anger back at somebody. And so that's always the kind of thing. But I, I urge people to think about that. I think one of the things that was the hardest thing for me to go through was to recognize that racism was not directed at me and that I was not the one for which I should take it up personally. That it's directed at a whole group. And as a result of that, you know, I have to, I need to work through my own issues and anger when those things happen. But all, as you get through time, through experience, you realize that racism is directed at groups and rarely at individuals, and that people get angry because they think it's being directed at them individually, and it's often at the group. And, and so what we need to do is find ways to work through those kinds of scenarios so that we can get, have people think through what just happened. Thank you very much for that question. So we have time for one more question, um, maybe right here. Hi, I really enjoyed this. This was great. Um, but when we, we when you were first introduced, um, you were they were saying that you were trying to indigenize a, a Catholic church. Oh yeah. So when it was you decolonizing the ministries, which is what I've I've gone and done a couple of these, in which I've said to the priest, hey, we don't need another white man dressed up as an indigenous person carrying and appropriating our signs and symbols and traditions in order to make us think that you are doing something better for us. What you need to do is change your ideologies and your theologies and work with indigenous people in terms of where they are, where they are in terms of their own spiritualities and growth in them and not simply to think that we have to be assimilated for everything. Yeah, and so at the the reason the reason I bring that because um, when you're indigenizing an academy, essentially you're, you're trying to raise the conscience of an institution. So you know, with that being said, and you and you just saying that you were talking, you know, to the priest. So what 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 do you do to empower the people to become interested and not inter uninterested? <laughs> How do you get people who are uninterested interested? <laughs> um, well, there's always the carrot and then there's always the stick. Um, <laughs> 
And that's always <laughs> been the way in which we pedagogically can use the carrot as a, what would entice them to move in this direction. And I think that uh, today, with the, with the with Truth and Reconciliation Commission, with areas like the Indigenizing Academy, that we have a growing movement that is so large and wide, and we can find and help people by giving them specific kinds of things that will help them to move along. I think we're still a growing, we, we love to learn, everyone is a lifelong learner, and so finding a way to gently encourage people to learn and to take their learning to the next step. Um, the stick is a court. You know, um, the stick is let's take somebody to court for not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And but I've so often said I I very much like to you know win a lottery so that I can take up the whole comprehensive claims of all the five provinces you know in my territory. But you know that means I'm going to have to do some radical uh, gambling. Um, and I'm not sure I'm ready to do that. Um, but it is a kind of thing. There's, there's the, 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 the large arm of the courts, there's the large arm uh, that goes with uh, um, the, the motivation which TRC asks people to say that, you know, maybe you don't think you've done in your lifetime uh, have been racist or colonialist, Perhaps you never thought yourself, or you're even your family, good people, Christian people, and um, coming from particular places that you said, we never experienced, uh, or that we were held uh, to notions that, um, that, uh, uh, that racism existed. But I would say that, you know, in, the, in these prairies, it's difficult to see anything but racist discourses that continue. And I would say that, when people do it, the denial of, you know, this isn't, um, is, hasn't happened, it has happened. And in colonization, racism and sexism and all the other isms that go with it are part of the Canadian, American, even more so, fabric. Um, and we need to understand it and, and deconstruct it and, and also to begin to ameliorate the, the direction we're going to go in in terms of making changes for the future. Um, and to do so requires that every one of us, you know, it's sort of like the Thomas King story, you know, he says, you know, here, I've given it to you, and what you do with it from here on in is up to you. Never say you weren't told. In this case, Barry Sinclair has said to us more often than once that, you know, we each, every one of us, now have heard it. What are we going to do about it? because each one of us carries a bit of that legacy in our hearts and our minds and our spirits. And even indigenous people have carried the weight of colonization, and it's time we address it, both at the individual level as well as the collective level. And when we do so, we find that we find strength in it, and we find a more wide collective community to which we will have a more sustainable world by having that kind of dialogue and connections thereafter. Thank you very much. I guess that's it. Well, thank you, Marie. Um, before we adjour adjourn for the evening, um, we just want to make a few thank yous. So first to our speakers, um, live speaker Star Blanket, um, Dr. Stonechild, Dr. Batiste, and Dr. Tibbins, thank you so much for participating in the evening. We'd also like to uh, make a few more thank yous to the U of R conference services for the space that we're in, uh, U of R catering services for some refreshments, and also U of R AV for sound tech support and recording this lecture. Um, and finally, I'd like to thank all of you, our captive audience, for your attendance tonight. Please do join us outside the atrium for some refreshments. And um, thank you, Miigwech.